Welcome to the programme. It's Ian Dale here with you until 10. Now, in the first hour of the programme, we're going to do something a little bit different today because some of you may remember on the first day that the Russians invaded Ukraine, we talked to a Ukrainian Member of Parliament, Alexei Goncharenko, and he's a Member of Parliament for Odessa, which, of course, has been in the headlines over the last few weeks with missile strikes from Russia. Well, I'm delighted to say that Alexei is joining me in the studio live for the next hour, and he's very happy to take your call if you've got questions on what's going on in Ukraine at the moment, questions about the war, questions about how Ukraine has reacted to the war, questions about how Ukraine managed to win the Eurovision Song Contest. Alexei's is here to answer those questions. 0345 6060 973 is the number to call. Well, Alexei, it's great to see you in the studio because I remember after our interview finished um, on February the 24th, um, I said to my producer, I wonder whether we'll ever speak to him again, because you you have been quite outspoken in your criticism of Russia over the years. And I sort of, uh, in a way, kind of assumed that once the invasion started, you would be one of the first targets for the Russians. But you're here, which is fantastic. Welcome to LBC. Thank you very much. I'm also happy to be here. <laughs> Thank you. But did, I mean, be honest, did you feel as if you would be under threat right from day one? Yeah, especially the first days. I remember clearly these first days, and let's be honest, many people in the world, in the West, thought that Ukraine will fail in several days. And uh, and me too, nobody knew what will be next. And uh, when there was a proposition to evacuate from Kiev, I refused, and I joined territorial defense, militia, I received weapons. I fortunately, because I'm absolutely a civilian person, fortunately I wasn't on the battlefield, but I took part in secondary missions, checkpoints, convoys, evacuation of people also from Bucha and European area. And for three weeks I was more like on the military side uh, than to being a politician. Um, but after this we kicked off Russians from Kiev and uh, we understood that we survived and we will win. But first days, yeah, they were very hard and uh, nobody knew what will be next. And yeah, so I, I'm also happy to be here. And I came to the United Kingdom because United Kingdom is showing leadership in support of Ukraine. And I want to thank all British people who now listening to us. Just great thank you for all, for on behalf of all Ukrainian people, millions of Ukrainians, for all help to our refugees, humanitarian aid, for weapons that we are receiving, and for huge support. It's not because I am in London, but I am saying it everywhere, that UK shows the leadership in this, and we appreciate it enormously. I think a lot of us look at what's going on in Ukraine and we try to imagine if it happened here, would would we as a people react in the same way that Ukrainians have reacted? Would we be as brave as many Ukraine? I mean, you, you went from a life of being a parliamentarian to being on military checkpoints and having to handle weapons. I, I, a lot of people will have found that very difficult to do, to, to leave one life behind them and enter a whole new world. We don't have any other options. It was to be or not to be, existential threat. We have only this land, we cannot surrender it, and we cannot give up it. So no other options. I'm sure that British people will defend their land absolutely the same, courageously, furiously, because, and you showed it in Second World War. And, uh, and this is, I, I believe this is the Third World War, and that it's already started. And, but we have the chance the difference is that we have the chance to stop it much earlier. Because like in 1939, Poland f failed. It was attacked from two sides. Mm. And Ukraine uh, had not failed and w will not fail. So this is the chance for us to stop it now, not to give this flame possibility to burn the whole Europe and maybe more. So uh, I'm sure that you will also fight. And yes, but I'm absolutely proud to be Ukrainian today. Uh, many, you, you've heard a lot of, I know that about millions of Ukrainians who left the country, but these are women and children and aged people. But there are hundreds of thousands of men, even those who lived in Europe for years, who came back to the country to take weapons in their hands. 
and uh, and to fight or oh, to to help i mean like secondary missions like i did and others so there, there, there are hundreds of thousands we don't have any problem with people who are ready to fight we don't need any boots on the ground on our ground we know but what we need is weapons because still russians have they have advantage in air and we still need air defense aircrafts long range artillery uh, aircrafts especially because we for for whole the war we received zero aircrafts air defense only short uh, range uh, but we need long range and every day new missile attacks against like today my native odessa was again attacked and there was a small hotel hit and two adults are wounded and one six-year-old child is heavily wounded so and ha- it happens every day throughout the whole country so we, we stop them on the ground we won the battle for kiev now i can tell you that we won the battle for kharkiv which is the second largest city in the country just 30 kilometers from russian border we stopped them on the sea with this cruiser missile cruiser moscow which is now submarine because we just sank down it uh but air is our weak point for the moment and i hope that with western weapons we we can finish it like churchill said give us the tools and we'll finish the work that's what we're asking for but but this is our my objective number one what one thing which struck me before the invasion was how calm whenever whenever i interviewed somebody from kiev for example whether it was a british journalist or, or somebody who is ukrainian Everybody seemed to be going about their normal business. There didn't seem to be really any anticipation of an invasion. When did you think this is going to happen? First of all, we are in the war from 2014. It's eight years of war already. Yes, it was a, like a first. It was a middle middle intensity war, then low intensity. But this was a war, and every day we knew about some fightings. Every month, ten. 12 Ukrainian uh, soldiers and officers were killed. So we lived in this situation. But also I agree with you that many of us, and I can tell you me personally, I thought that it is very, very unlikely that something like this could happen. I was waiting for some attack in Donbass, some provocations, but not for a full-scale war in the middle of Europe in 21st century. It was so, I don't know, crazy idea that it could happen. And even now, I can tell you, sometimes I, I think to myself that, is it not a dream? Is it reality? What's mm-hmm. going on? Because it's so strange. But it happened. Uh, and uh, yeah, I can tell you, I came just on Saturday to London. And when I hear plane in the air, I think this is a missile. That is another way of understanding of life when you're coming from a battle area, which is the whole Ukraine. We can't say that it is just a front line because these missile attacks are throughout the whole country. Mm. So, yeah, the, that is the reality for us today. But certainly our best, best wish is just to finish it as soon as possible. I mean, obviously, everyone would like to see it finished as soon as possible. But, but what does finished mean? Does it mean the last Russian soldier leaves Ukrainian soil? Does it mean that Crimea has to be restored to Ukraine? Yes. It, our victory for us is full liberation of our territory. Crimea is Ukraine. Donetsk and Lugansk is Ukraine. So, yes. But it can happen in stages. So, the first stage... Uh, is come is retreating of Russian troops to the line uh, or before February 24. That is the first stage. Because before this invasion, it was not Ukraine who started to liberate our territories by force, no. So we, there was political process, uh, an attempt of, attempt of negotiations. We tried. Uh, because the life for, of every Ukrainian for us, of every human for us is priceless. Not like for Russians, because they're just awful things. They don't even take bodies of their killed from the battlefield. I, I can't understand this, absolutely. So, uh, first stage should be that they're retreating to February 24. 
then we can discuss other things. But the, the, the result, the final result of this should be the full liberation of Ukrainian territory. So when you hear some Western politicians, including some in this country, say, well, inevitably there will have to be a peace deal, inevitably there will be a compromise, and, and there will be... I mean, if, if the war is to be over relatively quickly, Ukraine will have to recognize that Russia will still have an, at least an influence in Crimea and the Donbass. What do you say to people who think that? Uh, first of all, you know, we are ready for compromises. We don't want to execute Putin on the Red Square. We don't want him to kill himself in his bunker like Hitler did. He's Hitler of the 21st century. His fate should be the same. But we are not going to do this. We don't want any inch of Russian territory. So this is our compromise. Even after all of this, we don't want to come after Putin and, uh, and to take Moscow like Berlin was taken. No. We just want them to leave our country. That's all. So this is compromise. So what, what other compromise should be? Uh, it couldn't be compromise that we are saying Crimea is Russian. Because it will mean that it is a salami tactics. It is cutting the tail by pieces. Today it's Crimea, tomorrow next part, the next part. No. We, it's something which is not uh, in our interest at all. We cannot accept this. But what we can accept, again, we can accept peace negotiations. We can accept uh, that we can wait uh, by, politic, uh, by politics, diplomacy. We can wait and speak. But uh, it couldn't be compromised with the cost of Ukrainian land. That's not right compromise. And I want to tell you that aggressor d never ever in human history understands compromises. Just let's make lessons from history of the Second World War. There was attempt to make compromises with uh, Hitler, with the cost of Czechoslovakia, with the cost of uh, uh, other, other uh, countries. And w did it work? No. Because aggressor considers any compromise as weakness. So aggressor should see that free world is strong enough to unite and to stop him. And also it is important not only for us, but for the whole planet. Because Putin, unfortunately, is not the only dictator in the world. And other dictators are now watching what will be his destiny, what will be his re results. And if they will see that, he's, that he is successful, they will do the same. The whole planet will burn. So we need to show that free world can stop aggressors. And that is an extremely important message. Alexei, stay with us. Alexei is going to answer your questions. If you'd like to ask him a question, the number to call 0345 6060 or you can text your question to 84850. Uh, Cindy says, Ian, please pass on my love and support for Alexei and the people of Ukraine. It really is so heartfelt. I'm sure, Cindy, you speak for many, many people uh, listening to the programme right now. More from Alexei in just a moment. It's 18 minutes past seven. This is LBC. Hello.
Ian Dale on LBC. Text 84850. It's 20 past seven on LBC. Uh, we have a special hour tonight, and I, and I use that word advisedly because I think it is special to have a member of the Ukrainian parliament in the studio. You Mem may remember about, oh, what, five or six weeks ago, we had three female uh, members of the Ukrainian parliament with us. Well, today we have Alexei Goncharenko, member of the Ukrainian parliament for the European Solidarity Party. And uh, Alexei... You, you, when were you first elected to the Parliament? And, and tell us a bit more about your party affiliations, because it seems to me that at the moment, party affiliation doesn't matter at all. Absolutely. The only party now is Ukraine and Ukrainian flag. That is absolutely. I was in opposition to President Zelensky uh, before uh, February 24. And I think I will be in opposition after our victory. But uh, from February 24, there is no President Zelensky. There is Commander-in-Chief Zelensky. And I can only support him and all our army and do wherever I can, just all my, what I can, just to win. After this, we are a democratic country and we will have a lot of disputes, but that will be after. Speaking about me, I, I joined Parliament in 2014. This is my second term in the Parliament. Before I was President of Odessa Regional Council. Uh, before, in 2006, I was uh, in John Smith Fellowship Program here in the UK. John Smith, former la leader of yeah. Labour Party. No, I, I, I was part of that. I, I remember going on a trip to Armenia as part of that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So every year they invited... Uh, a number of people from post-Soviet countries, and I was one of lucky people in 2006 as Odessa City Council at that moment, being here in the UK. By the way, it was absolutely tremendous experience for me, very interesting, and I've fallen in love with the UK and for, whole, for the whole of my life. And um, that was my experience before. Also, I am founder of a very interesting network of, we call it Goncharenko Centers in Ukraine, which is educational cultural centers. And the first thing that they were doing, it was a, a learning of English language free of charge for children and adults in Ukraine, mostly in small towns, because in big cities you have a lot of opportunities. In small towns, not so many. But from February 24, all these centers, one center is occupied near Kherson, one is destroyed near Kharkiv, Several stop the operation in Donbass, but others are working as volunteer hubs, humanitarian aid, help to army, everything we can. We are cooperating also from, with people from the United Kingdom who will be happy to cooperate more with others. So that's what we are doing today. That's what we can do. Uh, and, and we will continue till our victory. That, that is our aim. I love how you're certain of victory. There's no, there's no question in your mind. No that question. This won't end in victory. Absolutely, no question. Absolutely. I, I believe that there is, you know, there is justice. We are. This is this war. This attack was absolutely unjustified. This is real evil against just goodness. You know, because unjustified attack, and after this, absolutely awful atrocities. I've been personally to all hot points in Ukraine, only Mariupol, I couldn't get there. But I was in Kharkiv, in Chernigiv, which was more than one month in siege. Uh, by the way, our center worked all this time there without any stop. I've been to Bucher, Pen Hostomel, evacuated people, and then I was with our army when we liberated it. I can tell you what I saw, it's so awful. Uh, maybe the, mo the, the, the most awful I have seen in my life, it was Kiev Zhitomir Autoroute. And there were like a small part of the road, more than one kilometer probably, near one mile, where there were cars shot down by Russians and burned down by them with just civilians who tried to run away from Kiev. And they shot it at them and killed them. And in one car, I saw a body of a boy, I think six, seven years old. It's very hard. I have two sons and it was so hard for me. I can't forget it. And it's very hard. Yeah. And uh, so after all of this, we don't have any other option, just, just victory. That's all.
That's all. Right, let's go to your calls because there's a lot of them coming in. 0345 6060 973. Uh, Brian in Colourcoats is our first caller. Brian, what would you like to ask Alexia? Hi, Alexia. I'm really proud of you, your government, and your people who are fighting for freedom for your country. And everybody in Britain, believe me, is absolutely proud for your people to stand up for freedom. But my question is do you agree with me that this government here? could do a lot more to help Ukrainian women and children to come to Britain. They've put lots of red tape in place with visas and loads of different form filling. We should be allowing everybody to come here without any checks. We should be bringing people here, you know, for safety and sanctuary. Do you agree we could do a lot more? Uh, thank you very much for your support, first of all. You know, I don't want to look unthankful because uh, British people, first of all, and British government are really leading the support. But what I can agree that uh, probably the United Kingdom is one of the countries which is uh, the most difficult for refugees to come. And all this visa story for Ukrainians is is very difficult. And I think, I, I, I feel that it can be visa liberation for Ukrainians. And like Europe, Europe did for Ukrainians, and there were also concerns in Europe that maybe millions of Ukrainians will try to run away. No, this, this, this never happened. Uh, because Ukrainians want to live on their land. Even now, our refugees, then uh, refugees, not because they want to run from the country, but all of them, not certainly, I can't say all of them, maybe part of them wants to stay, but 90% of them want to come back home. They live with this just mm. every day. But the problem is for that for some of them, there is no place where to go back because their cities are occupied, their houses are destroyed. But even now, after Kiev, for example, became safer place, thousands and thousands, I think hundreds of thousands of people came back to Kiev. Uh, that was a, like a huge, huge number of cars coming back, back home, back home. So... I believe that, yes, it can be more less restrictions for Ukrainians in this moment, in this situation, and in future. I believe, in general, that like in Eurovision, you mentioned... Don't mention Eurovision. Uh, yeah, but you mentioned <laughs> it's it. It's a sore yeah. point. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but uh, Ukraine was... Uh, number one, UK number two, and we understand that it was impos you impossible give, you to be... You did give us 12 points. Uh, so we yeah, yeah, then we <laughs> did. And But it was it was clear that you, Ukraine would win this time. So the second place is, uh, is no, <laughs> I, almost it's the a first. It's victory. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But what I want to say that I want to see the situation that Ukraine and UK had together is best too. Always best too. I think that we are we can be so complementary to one another. We can do so many one with another. Uh, Britain with all her history, with a very strong navy, uh, with a strong economics, innovations. Ukraine with a very strong army, probably the best army in Europe. Now it's not just my words of patriotism. It's the fact. Who stopped this uh, Putin's war machine? Uh, with a very fertile land with the people who are ready to stand for freedom and fight for it till the death. I think that is very, so complementary and that can work so good together. So we need to be as close as possible. And it means less visa restrictions, less re more, 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 more cooperation in all, absolutely all areas. And uh, that's what I believe in. Are you seeing any government ministers while you're here? Yes, uh, I plan uh, tomorrow and the day after tomorrow to meet with officials and uh, members of the parliament. Because uh, we, we had the Minister for Refugees mm -hmm. sitting where you're sitting about a month ago now, and our listeners gave him a very, very hard time about the fact that it was taking so long for people to get through the bureaucracy, and he promised to make it simpler. And um, he has promised to come back. Um, I think we are getting a date from him, hopefully, for next week. What would be your message to the Minister for Refugees? And um, we'll, we'll play it out to him when he does come back. Thank you so much. My message is absolutely clear. Uh, please support today people of Ukraine by giving them opportunity. These people suffered so, so, so heavily. So uh, to, to suffer around all this bureaucracy and these papers 
it's not a good story. And you will see that Ukrainians will not cause any harm to anybody. Ukrainians are very, I mean, we are Christians, we are very polite, we are European nation, and we are very thankful for all support we are receiving. And after the people will have possibility to come back, they will come back, come back home. So please open the country, open the country for Ukrainian refugees also, like many countries did, especially Poland. I, I, we are so thankful to Polish people. They were just coming to border and Polish uh, officials, they were letting Ukrainians come in even without documents because some of documents were burned down, people lost everything. And they said, you can go, you can come in. And people were waiting in near the border, just ordinary Polish people taking them to their homes. It's so touching, yeah. Where did you get that shirt? Ah, uh, For yes. people who aren't watching, who are listening, Alexei has got this quite amazing shirt on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your question. <laughs> I was waiting. <laughs> yeah, um, th this is like a special traditional Ukrainian shirt. It is called Vyshevanka. And but this one is quite special. Historically, they were not this kind because this is a marine style. This is already modern style because I'm from Odessa, which is uh, the biggest city on the Black Sea. So this one is in Ukrainian tradition, but with a marine with these anchors and blue. Uh, so, but the, I I decided to wear it today. Uh, in sign of our victory in Eurovision, it was also in quite ethnical style. And also because I'm proud to be Ukrainian and also to show this to people, because today I was in, uh, I, I took part in some media appearances and I wanted to show that uh, we have this culture, we have this proud of ourselves, but the, at the same time, we are absolutely of one civilization. We, I feel here like home. Because it, because we are one civilization, one uh, Christian civilization with all these roots, uh, and and that is so important, and that's what makes us human. Well, we'll hear a lot more from Alexei over the course of the next half an hour, and then, of course, at eight, we have our Monday edition of Cross Question, where I'll be joined by Andy MacDonald, the Labour MP for Middlesbrough, Afra Hagen, broadcaster and journalist, Lord Ed Vasey, Conservative peer, former Culture Minister, and Mo Hussein, political commentator and former Special Advisor to Amber Rudd at the Home Office. I'm sure you've got questions lined up for all of them after eight o'clock. It's 7.32 on LBC, the news headlines with Amelia Cox. Boris Johnson is being accused of placating the DUP over power sharing in Northern Ireland. Sinn Féin says the Prime Minister is taking sides as the Unionist Party protests against post-Brexit trade arrangements. A 22-year-old man has been found guilty of murdering a PCSO in Kent last year. Julia James was attacked by Callum Wheeler while walking her dog in Woodland in April last year. And Russia says it'll have to respond after Sweden joined Finland in applying for NATO membership. But President Vladimir Putin insisted Moscow has no problem with either country. LBC weather, rain continuing in northern areas tonight, turning dry overnight with clear skies developing in the south, lows of 8 degrees. This is LBC.
Ian Dale on LBC. 7.35 on LBC. Alexei Gonjarenko is with me, Ukrainian Member of Parliament. Let's go through a couple of texts before we come back to your calls. Uh, Mike in Fairham says, What an excellent guest. All the Ukrainian politicians seem to be smart, intelligent and eloquent. We should ask them to coach our lot of politicians on how to communicate effectively. That's a compliment, by the way, Alexei. Thank you. Um, now, another one. Putin won't accept defeat. Ukraine doesn't want to compromise for the sake of supporting Ukraine. The whole world could be destroyed destroyed if a nuclear war breaks out. Is it worth it to sacrifice the whole world because Ukraine wants to join NATO? Thank you for, for this question. May I ask it? Oh, may, sorry, may I answer yeah, it? Yeah, do. Thank you. Uh, first of all, it's not absolutely about NATO. I don't know the name who asked this question, but don't believe in this story that it Putin wars against enlargement of NATO and so on. Putin started this war this is the facts, what I'm telling now, in February 2014. At this moment, in U it w Ukraine uh, was absolutely neutral state without no intention to join NATO. Never ever, before Putin invaded Ukraine, Ukraine uh, put it as a strategic goal into constitution. And it was only because of Putin's attack that Ukraine realized that the only way for our security is to join NATO. So absolutely another you know, uh, uh, line. So the line is that Ukraine was neutral state and was happy with this. And also we received guarantees when we voluntarily gave up nuclear weapons for the first yeah. time in human history in 1994, the first and the last time for the moment, we voluntarily gave up nuclear weapons. We received guarantees from the United Kingdom, United States and Russian Federation that we will be ter about our territorial integrity and sovereignty. Then Russia absolutely speeded on it, at brutally violated everything, attacked us. From this moment, we realized that all these guarantees is just paper, nothing, nothing more than paper, and it costs nothing. And the only way to, to, to have a security, to have safety, is to be a member of defensive alliance, which is NATO. That's the same story today with Sweden and Finland. They were neutral for decades. Yeah. From, from the Second World War, War even before. But now they saw how dangerous is Putin and they're saying we want to go to NATO. So when Putin said that the, the aim of the war is to prevent enlargement of NATO, but he did absolutely opposite. He provoked the enlargement of NATO because everybody understood that it's, this world is not so safe. So don't believe in these stories that this war is because Ukraine wants... No, this war is because Putin wants to be emperor and to rebuild Russian empire. That's because... I mean, war is about weapons, but it's also about propaganda, isn't it? And, yeah, absolutely. And, and obviously we see that a lot from the Russian side. But um, Boris, not that one, Boris has got a question here. He says, I'm spending a lot of time discussing and defending the Ukrainian cause and democratic freedoms on social media. It's so important for us all. Please ask your guest to explain how he refutes and defends against the Nazi accusations against the Ukrainian government and their troops, which I encounter so frequently online and sadly not just from Russian bots. Thank you very much for your question. Yes, Russian propaganda, they invested hundreds of millions of pounds in their propaganda for years and certainly now we, we see the results of this. But what I want to tell you, our president is Jewish. We are Nazis. Uh, me personally, I was born in Odessa. My mother tongue is Russian. My second mother tongue is Ukrainian. I know more poems of Russian poets than Putin and all his entourage. It's for sure. Who are Nazis? Those who are defending their country? Those who are absolutely accepting all nations in Ukraine? We have no question about any problems from, for any religion, from Muslims, from Judaism, uh, represent, uh, for any. So Ukraine is absolutely free country. And Russia which is uh, uh, fighting against uh, witnesses of Yegova, which is uh, uh, going after Muslims and uh, so on and so on. So who is Nazis? I mean, so it's so, it's so, it's so, I just want you to know that I think, yes, there is one country in the world which needs denazification. This country is called Russian Federation because they are reincarnation of Nazism today. It's very pity for me to say 
uh, uh, it's painful, but that's true. Because what they're doing is exactly, listen what they, um, uh, in their state TV, you can find it on my Twitter. Uh, what they, on their state TV with, with English translation, they are telling about uh, African American, about Jewish people, uh, about, I don't know, uh, last very big scandal when Russian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Lavrov, said that Hitler was also partly Jewish. So that's not a reason. So Jew, and, and then was a big scandal from Israel. So, so you want to say that the Jewish people were killing themselves? Well, what do we want to say? So all this is absolutely not truth. Ukraine is a free democratic state. No Nazis in our... No, I can, you, maybe you can find some Nazis in every state in the world. But they are just... You can count them on fingers of several hands. Maybe they are in 40 million people. But no any any uh, influence on state politics. Nothing, absolutely. Right, let's go to another question. It's from Ulf in Hamburg. Ulf, guten Abend. What would you like to ask Alexei? Good evening. Well, I'm sure we are painfully aware of Germany's, well, underperformance as regards weapons for Ukraine. It may sound paradoxical, but do you have any idea what Olaf Scholz is playing at? Because I don't understand what he and his government are doing. Maybe you have some extra insight. It makes absolutely no sense what the German government is doing. And I am German. Vielen uh, Dank. Uh, yeah, uh, I can just all say you that for all of us, there is a big question what uh, some... I'm, some actions and words of uh, German government uh, are strange. And uh, first they said, oh, we cannot provide Ukraine with weapons at all. And you remember that the first delivery of, uh, was 5,000 helmets. That was, you know, when missiles are, are hitting your cities and tanks are shooting and nuclear power plants and country which you, 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 you hope to receive help from sending you helmets. 5,000 helmets from Germany. It was a little bit, you know, disappointing. And uh, it was a little understatement. Then they said, okay, we can send defensive weapons, but not attacking weapons. It was again hypocrisy, because, for example, I have a knife now. If with this knife I am attacking you, sorry, it is attacking weapon. But if you will attack me and I will defend myself with the knife, it is defensive weapon. Mm. So for Ukraine, there is no attacking weapon. We are just defending our territory. We have only defensive weapons, no others, because we didn't attack any ever, anybody. So I I agree that we are disappointed with many positions of German government. I hope very much that they will change their position. I feel. Uh, that Russians were using this guilty feeling for the Second World War of Germans, trying to, to, trying to exploit this, that they are guilty for most, before Moscow. But that's not true, because Ukraine and Belarus were, were two countries which suffered the most. So it's even more, I think, today is the possibility for German people just to finish this page by helping the world to stop new Nazism, which is now um, a renaissance of which we can see in Russia, unfortunately. So uh, I agree with all of that position of German government is often disappointing. I hope that they will change their position. And in general, unfortunately, I see lack of leadership in European countries. Um, that, is, uh, that is disappointing. I see more support from societies, from ordinary people mm. of Europe, then from leaders uh, and then from politicians, it's disappointing. Ulf, it was reported at the weekend that Chancellor Scholz put a stop to, I think, 80 military vehicles being supplied to Ukraine, even though they'd been signed off by the foreign minister, the green politician, um, Baerbock. Um, well, how, why, why would he do that? Because people are scratching their heads at that decision. I think you may be too. Uh, I haven't got the foggiest idea what that man is doing or thinking. You're, you're referring to those MARA anti-person, armored anti-personnel carriers, which could be yeah. put to use right away. Um, I don't understand it. Uh, really, uh, uh, Short comes up with a different explanation or excuse every week. If he says anything, it isn't, doesn't just produce evasive waffling. A few days ago, four FDP MPs left... Uh, 
um, an, um, a discussion with uh, Chancellor Scholz because he was so e- evasive, they just got fed up and stood up and left. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I can relate. Um, he, he's horrible. Uh, re- I regret my vote for the Social Democrats in the last federal elections. You may be pleased to hear that in the last state elections in Germany during the past few weeks, the Social Democrats got clobbered, deservedly. Mm. But, but, and dare I say, in the Eurovision Song Contest of Null Point. Uh, we got song for that. Maybe the song was awful too. I don't know. I never watched no, it. No, I love, I love the song. I couldn't believe it. I thought it was a great song. But uh, there we go. Anyway, we, we've had our share of Null Point. Anyway, we, we need to move on. Ulf, thank M- you for your call. May I add b- several Please words? Do. I just want to thank German people because I know how many are taking Ukrainian refugees to their families. Yeah. And I want to tell you, for example, in our charity of these Goncharenko centers that I told you, the biggest donation for the moment is from German citizen who reached us and asked us not to say his name anywhere, but who made the biggest donation for all this humanitarian aid. And I know that it's not the one, you know, case. It's many, many cases. So we're thankful for German people, and we hope that German people will make their government to change their position. Right, more calls from you in a moment to Alexei Goncharenko. He's here with us until 8, and then it's cross-question. Uh, the number for both bits of the programme, 0345 6060 We have Mo Hussein, former special advisor, Ed Vasey, Lord Vasey now, uh, Andy MacDonald, Labour MP for Middlesbrough, and Afra Hagen, broadcaster and journalist with us from 8. It's 7.47. LBC. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Weekday mornings from 7. Conservative MP and safeguarding minister Rachel McLean. Police will be permitted to stop and search people without suspicion of a crime. What happens if the police then apply to then seek an extension for a superintendent? So there is another time period, which I'm sure you've got in front of me. Well, you're Uh, the minister who's been briefed (laughs) for this. From what hours does it go? So the point is that these are put in place. Yes, what are the hours that a superintendent now can licence? I'm being quite upfront with you. I haven't got the paper in front of me. Do you not think you should no, Minister. I do know, but the oh, fact well, if you do I've know, had, do share. N- look, you're doing a very good job of demonstrating that I haven't got the papers in front of me now. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Back tomorrow morning from seven. Listen on your radio and on Global Player, LBC.
This is LBC with Ian Dale. Call 0345 6060 973. It's 10 to 8 on LBC. Alexi Goncharenko with me taking your calls. Let's go to Barry in Eltham. Hello, Barry. Hi, Ian. Hi, Alexi. Very nice to Hi. speak to you. Hello. And I have to say, I agree and support everything you've said. Um, Thank you my, so much. My question is specifically in relation to Mariupol. Uh, we've, we've seen how successful the Ukrainian troops have been in, in pushing back some of the Russian advances. But is it not possible that a rescue effort can't be undertaken to access and free the remaining soldiers left in the steel plant? There's nothing better I'd like to see than a breach had been made of the Russian perimeter and you've been able to rescue your troops there. What's going on? First of all, thank you, Barry, for your support and that you mentioned Mariupol, and that is extremely important for all of us today. I believe that today the capital of free world is Mariupol. That is where the heart is beating of free world. And our garrison, which is struggling absolutely unbelievably, uh, pushing back Russians for, for more than 10 weeks, it's unbelievable under siege. Uh, yes, and we want to save them. Speaking about rescue operation, I yes, I was for three weeks in militia, but I was a simple soldier there. So I, I'm not a military person to say is it possible or not. If our army is not doing this, probably it is impossible. But what can be possible and what can be done is to extract them from there. And there are many examples in the world when the combatants are taken to neutral state under the guarantees of this state that they will never come back to this war. A lot of times in the world's history, and that should be done this time to save these people. There are many of them are wounded in a very awful situation. So we will do everything we can to save them. We are ready to exchange them for Russian prisoners of war. We are ready for any any uh, resultive way to save their lives. But for the moment, Russians are refusing. Okay. We will see. Maybe next days will change something. Barry, thank you. Let's move on to Unesh in Edgware. Hello, Unesh. Good evening. Hi. Um, thank you for taking my call. And my question is, what's, uh, what's the guest view of uh, India being a neutral country, not supporting either Russia or Ukraine? Thank you very much, Unish, for your question. I, I quite often am on, Rush, on, sorry, on Indian TV, and I'm saying to them, and I'm disappointed with the position of Indian government. And also, it's not only about neutral situation. In general, Assembly of the United Nations, India abstained several times on the question of Ukraine, just stopping the war. Just nothing else. Stop the war. And India abstained. And I think that is not, is very, is very big mistake because India is the biggest democracy in the world the biggest democracy in the world. And India knows better than many other countries how it is dangerous to be neighbored by dictatorships. And I think that it is so important for India to show here that it, India is part of free world and to be and to unite with others around Ukraine. So I also hope that India will change uh, their attitude. But for the moment, really, I, can, I should say that I am disappointed with the position of Indian government. Uh, thank you, Unesh. Uh, final question from Tim in Leatherhead. Tim, hi. Hi, Ian. Um, it's not a question, actually. Um, Alexi, привет. I uh, pretty, uh, just listened. I've just listened to the most uplifting hour that I think I've ever heard on LBC. And, and I don't want to patronise you, but the way you have spoken with such authority, uh, clarity, but most of all, humility... I, I wish you all the very, very best. My daughter-in-law is Ukrainian. My grandchildren have great-grandparents from eight different countries. One of those is Ukraine and one of them is Russia. So I've paid a lot of attention to what's been going on. Our own government in the UK could really take a leaf out of your book. They, um, unfortunately, the collective intelligence of our government could not hold a light, hold a candle to you. You're doing it in a second language as well. I, I'm, a, I'm actually ashamed of the British government uh, and what they've done to prevent U, uh, Ukrainian refugees coming in. But that's not what I rang up to say. I just really wanted to wish you all the best and thank you for, for a fabulous hour. 
Tim, thank you so much. It's so kind. Thank you. Thank you again for all your words and all your support. Thank you. Well, I think Tim speaks for, I hope, but everybody who's been listening to this hour. You've been an absolute inspiration. Um, if you come, Whenever you next come back to London, you have an open invitation to come back on. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, welcome to Ukraine. Next year, Eurovision in Ukraine. Oh, no, how about we that? We will host it. Uh, well, I think I should be broadcasting my programme from there, don't you? Great idea. <laughs> Let's do it. It's a deal. Uh, well, I hope Ukraine does get to host it because a lot of people are saying, well, they won't be in a position to, but where there's a will, there's a way, as we've seen over the past few months. Alexi, thank you very much. Thank you.